Okay, so this is a video I've been meaning to put out for some time, long overdue, describing the calculations that I made for my zip line. This analysis is going to be broken up into three parts. Kinematics, forces and deflections, and then choice of lumber. Let's start by taking a look at the kinematics using the help of SketchUp. Let's first get a look at the side view here. Imagine this is a zip line. I like to actually consider the extremes. So this is this represents an extreme case for a zip line where there's no sag. This is a, a cable that's stretched very tightly. Okay, so you can imagine that a kid on a zip line like this, if it if it doesn't have any sag or any give, this kid's just going to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate all the way down until he slams into the end, and uh, that's not good. You can go on YouTube. And you can actually find videos of people that where the, the line is pulled too tight and they recommend okay so that's that's no good the other extreme is where the line is way too saggy and you know you start riding and you've seen plenty of videos of this too and they, they plow into the, you know they plow into the ground so the zip line has to be between those two extremes uh, this this represents something that looks pretty reasonable as the kid rides down the zip line there's a little bit of a dip but not enough that the kid hits the ground to calculate the forces in the next uh, spot, you kind of got to have a handle on this type of kinematics. So I'll tell you about the assumptions I made from this perspective. So let's do a little trigonometry now and look a little closer. And let's get a fresh sheet here. We're going to do a little bit of math. Let's assume that the rider is going to drop uh, four feet here. Okay, let's assume that this distance is four feet over a 90 foot run. A kit that I got offline had a, a 90 foot run and in my case actually my yard sloped so both both of mine were eight feet on the end eight feet eight feet if you start off with a, a totally flat yard maybe you'll have 12 feet on this end but in any case we can still we can still roughly look at this case we got to try to figure out what this angle is here in order to calculate the forces okay so let's break this line in half we're going to look at 45 feet which is the same as 540 inches and this is four foot equals 48 inches and if we just draw the triangle if you remember your trigonometry uh, we're trying to determine what this this angle we're trying to determine what this angle theta is here if we've got 48 over 540 we Calculate uh, tangent inverse of 48 over 540 equals 5.1 degrees. This is going to help us calculate the tension forces in this in this line. So we've got a line that stretches like this, like this. Let's say your kid weighs 100 pounds, and you've got five degrees of, of angle here. You've got tension in this line, tension in this line. Okay, your ten this is your force balance. Tension this line, tension this line, that's five degrees. So two times tension times sine of 5.1 is equal to 100 pounds. This is your force balance here. And you can very easily see tension is equal to 560 pounds. You solve this equation, you get 560 pounds of tension. That's about how much your 100 pound kid puts in the line. If it drops 48, inches over the run it's going to put about put about 560 pounds of tension in the line so at this point we have taken a look at the kinematics we have roughly calculated the forces now we have to get a handle on deflections and this can come from two sources one it can come from movement of the endpoints trees number two it can come from cable stretch for the hell of it, let's go ahead and calculate cable stretch first. I'm going to use a uh, an online calculator. All right, so let's type in calculate cable stretch. We know that uh, our 100-pound kid is putting about 560 pounds of uh, force into the cable. A full 90 foot run is uh, 1080 inches long. The cable that came with my kit was uh, 3 16ths of an inch, which is uh, 0.188. We're going to calculate that. Holy cannoli, two inches of stretch. 
Let's keep that in mind. Okay, that's a good bit of stretch. Now let's see what about how much do the trees move? Let's consider the endpoints to be beam and bending. And we're going to consider the ground to be rigid and we're going to apply a load here over 560 pounds force and if we use two two by 12s of dimensional lumber this cross section here if we laminate two of these two of these bad boys together and we look down on this this is two of these that's going to make this uh, three inches and it's going to make this 11 and a half inches is, is this dimension here. We're going to use some beam bending equations for cantilevered beam. This is what we're going to Let's use. Go back to Google. Beam bending equations. This is our equation. The load that's being yanked on the end of a beam that is uh, set in a perfectly rigid uh, foundation. So the deflection is equal to PL cubed over 3 E. The deflection is equal to PL cubed over 3 E I. So what is each of these things? P is the force, okay? L is the height of the tree. E is, is a material constant, Young's modulus. I, I'm going to assume it's about 10 gigapascals. And I'm switching units here. I do like metric better. <laughs> and then I is the moment of inertia. It describes how stiff the cross section of the beam is. So I'm going to assume that. that Stiffness is 10 GPA. Southern yellow pine, if you plug in all the constants here, you might as well keep going on this. 560 pounds is about 2,500 newtons. Eight foot high, okay, so this is our P, okay. L, eight foot high is the same as 2.43 meters. E is 10 GPA. Pascals, 10 times 10 to the ninth Pascals. And then I, we can get that by knowing the cross section of that beam. 1 12th BH cubed, where this is B and this is H. 1 12th BH cubed, which is 1 12th times 0.0762. times 292 cubed, 1.58 times 10 to the negative fourth. And that's units of meters to the fourth. six millimeters. Wow, that's about a quarter inch. About 0.3 inches. 7.57 millimeters or about 0 0.3 inches. Okay, let's go back now to what we had here. All right, the cable is stretching two inches. Each one of these trees is going to move about 0 0.3, but there's two of them, so 0 0.6. Let's just quickly throw these deflections back into the kinematics to see if it's reasonable. Remember that we calculated a total of 2.6 inches of slack in the 90 foot long line. Two from the cable stretch and 0.6 from the movement of the endpoints. These two things add together. Let's take a look at half of the system just because it's easy to look at triangles like this. Okay, the run is 540 inches. Cable with slack is 540 plus 1.3 inches. And we want to know what this is here. We assumed, remember we assumed it was 48, but let's see what, what slack do you actually get if you if you consider this 1.3 inches. Remember Mr. Pythagoras says that a squared plus 
b squared is equal to c squared. Okay, so b is equal to square root of c squared minus a squared. So square root of 541.3 squared minus 540 squared. B calculates out to 37 and a half inches. So how does this compare? Remember, we, we did our kinematics based on this 48 up here. 37 and a half is less than 48. So in reality, the system is probably going to end up deflecting somewhere in between these two values. My calculations very specifically show that if you have two eight foot high cantilevered endpoints made from two two by 12s laminated together, then a 100 pound kid could get a decent ride and the forces and deflections are within reasonable parameters. This very precise language was intentionally specific to my situation and my needs and wants. If you don't have suitable trees in your yard, you can probably think of a few different ways to anchor the endpoints. My kid's zip line is pretty close to the ground for the entire ride, so it was important for me to minimize the deflections. The major takeaway I hope everybody gets from this video is that the stiffness of the endpoints is critical. Very small sources of slack, which in my opinion come from two sources, stretch in the cable and movement of the anchor points, these very small sources of slack have a major effect on the ride. It would be really cool if a few more people showed their designs and calculations. If you or if someone you're aware of puts in a zip line installation with man-made anchor points instead of trees, please comment below. I'd love to see it. Love to see how someone else skinned this cat. Thanks for watching.